utilized in many regional Asian cuisines. They are an enormously popular ingredient in soups or eaten a la carte as a savory snack or entree. <laughs> no! Who looks at a chicken and is like, give me its feet? Brings a whole new meaning to the term chicken Ew. fingers. You want to shake hands? Uh, I'm just going to do it with my hands. Oh, my God. Oh, it's <laughs> floppy. <laughs> I feel like I'm holding it like a little baby wrist. Yeah. Do we eat the bone? There is there a bone? It? Oh, there's a bone. Oh, it's all bone. It's all bone. I don't think it's that bad. It would be better if it didn't look like a foot. Yeah. A balut is a developing duck embryo that is boiled and eaten in the shell. It's a common street food in the Philippines and Southeast Asia and is best when served with beer. Hard boiled egg? Mm. Oh my god, what is that? Oh god. Oh no. It's a bird. Oh, it's a duck! That's a duck! I am not eating this. I think I just threw up a little in my mouth. Dude, I'm seeing like the first feathers in there. Oh. I never had a chance. Sanakji is a very special raw Korean dish consisting of a live octopus that has been chopped into small pieces and served immediately with a light sesame seasoning. Oh, it's alive still. I'm moving it's around. Oh! oh my god. Oh, it fell. Oh, it's moving. <laughs> I'm too afraid to swallow it. Swear. You okay? No! I've totally stuck to my tooth. It's like getting a rubber band that is screaming for its life inside of you. Yeah, the thing to remember is that even some Asians find these foods not that great. This Asian. Uh... I'm so sorry. I'm really not sorry. You're right. Yeah, I've been, pa I've been pastoring as a vocation for the last 25 years. Before I was a pastor, my vocation was importing commercial fasteners uh, by the boatloads from Asia. And from my travels, I can testify that Asians really do have a taste for some really challenging food options for which I personally have sampled over the years, like a delica delicacy called the 100-year-old egg. Anybody eat this? It's, it's an egg that basically you buried in the ground for weeks or for months in a mixture of clay and ash and lime and salt and rice, and which turns the inside into this dark brown egg white and this kind of yellowy yolk, and it has this strong smell of ammonia and sulfur. It's yummy, <laughs> if you can keep it down. I've eaten sea cucumbers. Anybody have a sea cu cucumber? Trust me, a sea, cu sea cucumber is not a cucumber. It's not even a vegetable. And of course, it's considered an honor in Asia for the guests to eat the eyes of a fish. The fish are usually served whole on a plate. The eyes are still there. And I've swallowed down many fish eyes back or two back in the day. And all I can say about these foods is it helps to keep your beer close by. <laughs> so as we continue in their series and living in exile, today's message really has nothing to do about exotic food, but it does have something to do with creepy things. And that's pretty creepy stuff. And in this case, it's a creepy vision that is given to a prophet named Ezekiel of a valley that's filled from one end to the other with the scattered human bones of dead people. And how appropriate that it was just Halloween two days ago. Ooh, spooky type of thing. So Ezekiel, whose Hebrew name is pronounced Yechezkel, that's his Hebrew name, which means God will strengthen is about 25 years old when he's captured with that first wave of elite exiles in 605 BCE, exiled to Babylon under the rule of King Nebuchadnezzar. He's about 30 years old, so it's about five years later when he receives his first prophetic vision from God. And we know this because in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1, we're given some dates about his age and the place that place him in, the Bab in Babylon during the time of that first wave of exiles. It says in the 30th year, probably meaning his 30th year of, of being alive, and in the fourth month of the fifth day, while I was among the exiles in the Kebar River, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. Daniel was another young elite Israeli exiled during the first wave. I'm sure they were friends, and Ezekiel mentions him a couple times in the book of Ezekiel. So from the age of 30 until the age of 37, Ezekiel is given visions and prophecies in the form of stern warnings in hopes that the remaining Israelites that are still in Jerusalem would repent and put a halt to any further judgment by God. But God's pleas through Ezekiel are ignored, and King Nebuchadnezzar returns a couple of times, but the last time he destroys Jerusalem 
capturing and exiling most of the remaining Israelites to Babylon. From that point on, Ezekiel's visions turn from judgment and punishment to hope and restoration. And the vision that God gives Ezekiel of a valley filled with human bones is intended to bring a message of hope to all those exiles who have sustained incredible losses through these terrifying experiences and are feeling at this point that any hope of restoration is dead. And just maybe some of you here this morning might be feeling hopeless about the losses you have sustained in your life. But be encouraged because today's message is really for you. Our text today is Ezekiel chapter 37. We'll start with verses 1 and 2, and it says this. The hand of the Lord was upon me, meaning Ezekiel. And he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord, and he set me in the middle of a valley, and it was full of bones. So there's lots of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. Now notice these aren't merely described as bones. They're described as dry bones, which means they'd be void of any marrow, which means that these bones are way past the final stages of body decay. When a body dies physically, it goes through a series of decaying stages. In the first stage, blood stops pumping through the body, and because of gravity, it tends to pull up in certain areas of the body. Shortly after this, the muscular tissues become rigid. This is called rigor mortis. Next, the body loses heat, and it cools in the process called algor mortis. Then the body goes through bloating, which means that the microbes are rapidly growing and forming gases within the body. This is usually uh, when bugs and insects begin to feed and reproduce on the remains. Told you it's going to be a little creepy this morning. In the third stage, there's a rapid loss of mass due to the insect feeding and natural purging of fluids from decom decom decomposition. That was hard to get out. Advanced decay is the fourth stage, and there's little left of the body at this point. And finally, the last stage is skeletonization, where there's no more flesh and only bones remain. The bones in Ezekiel's vision are significantly past this last stage. They've been baking for a while. Which is most likely meant to emphasize that there's absolutely no hope whatsoever that whoever belonged to these bones will ever live again. Which is why when we get to the next verse, in verse 3, God says to Ezekiel, Son of man, can these bones live? And Ezekiel answers, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. Okay, so you know how sometimes we might frame an answer to a question in a more tactful, diplomatic way to certain people, especially the people in authority? Have you ever done that? Okay. Like to a boss? or to a parent, or a teacher, or maybe even a judge in court. And we typically use a more tactful response uh, to people in authority in situations like this because we think that if we answer it without any filter, we might get in trouble. Well, I think that's what's going on here with Ezekiel as he's answering God's question. So let me translate Ezekiel's carefully and cautiously worded answer as if instead he was answering the question to God, um, he's answer, instead of answering this question to God, he's answering it to a few of his exile buddies while hanging out the local Babylonian brew pub, okay? Because it would come, I think it would come out a little different. And so if his buddies were to ask him the question, I think Ezekiel would most likely say something like, not until hell freezes over. There's no way. When I was in seminary, one of my pastoral classes toured a local uh, mortuary to see how morticians prepare a body for burial and to teach us how to help those who are going through difficult times uh, through the loss of a loved one. During the tour, we entered into a room where a fresh cadaver had just been delivered. And somebody had placed a translucent cloth over the unclothed, it was an unclothed male body, and since this was the first time I had ever seen a dead body. How many of you have ever been and seen a dead body? Yeah, oh, a lot of you have, okay. First time I had seen that, uh, 
It was a pretty intense moment for me. And as the class ex exited the room, I lingered behind, intrigued by the sight of death. And when no one else was left in the room, my curiosity got the best of me. So I reached out, and I put my hand on this dead man's leg to see what a dead body felt like. And guess what happened when I touched his leg? No, you're right. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing happened because when you're dead, you're dead. You've all been watching too many Halloween movies <laughs> over the weekend, huh? How many of you watch nonstop Halloween movies over the weekend? All right. Y'all. Okay, we'll visit your parents later. Okay. <laughs> you see, to this point in Ezekiel's life, there's absolutely nothing in his life experience that would inform him that dead things come back to life. When you're dead, you're dead, and that's it. And that's why the psalmist says in Psalm 103, verse 15 and 16, life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it's gone, and its place remembers it no more. King Solomon said it this way in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. It says, there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot. In other words, everything has a life cycle. Every organic thing that we see on this planet has a life cycle. And when that life cycle is over, it's done. It's dead. There's no going back. And that's the only world Ezekiel knows when God asks him this question. And so he, he says, only you know, Lord. What do I know except what I experience in life? What I see is that everything that lives eventually dies. And I don't see anything that dies come back to life once it's dead. That's my experience. But that reality is about to change for Yechezkel, God will strengthen, because God goes on to say to him in verse 4 and 10, this is what he says, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones, I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and, come, uh, and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise and a rattling sound and the bones came together bone to bone. And I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the Lord says, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain so that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded, and breath entered them, and they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. That is a vision and a half right there. Now, I showed you all a video of this event in a previous series that we did, and I want to show it to you again because it's a good visual of what takes place in this passage. This scene here in Ezekiel 37 is one of a valley filled with dry bones, but notice that the scene that God has given Ezekiel is, one, is not one where you can imagine skeletons, whole skeletons lying side by side in their distinct forms, but rather where their various the various bones of these skeletons are randomly scattered across the valley. Which means that God not only has to restore the flesh and the spirit to these bones, he's got to locate which bone belongs to each person and then put them back together like a big giant jigsaw puzzle in order to res resurrect them in their previous life forms. So Yosef's hip might be somewhere on the north end of the valley, but his jawbone might be somewhere on the south end. And Miriam's skull might be on a ditch on the west end. Her kneecap might be on a mound on the east end. And God is giving Ezekiel this very hopeless picture for a reason. Because when you've been captured and exiled to a foreign land, and when your homeland has been leveled to the ground, 
There's absolutely no hope of ever going back to that life again. That chapter is over. It's dead. End of story. It doesn't happen. But as you watch this video, think about something in your own life that may have died. Something that you have no hope of ever seeing come back to life again. It could be your marriage. Could be another significant relationship. Could be a career. Could be the loss of a loved one. Your home, your health, whatever. Think about something. Everybody, life is just a series of acquisitions and losses. So we all have both of those things. Now watch this video and know that God can resurrect any hopeless situation back to life. The hand of the Lord was upon me. He brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the voice of the Lord. I will make breath into you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, and say to it, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Well, not quite a vast army. <laughs> <laughs> I love that video to that point right there. It's like, well, where's the vast army? <laughs> but I love that visual. Isn't that incredible? Kind of gives you an idea of what that might have been like to watch that happen. So God goes on in verse 11 through 14 to explain to Ezekiel what this vision means. He says to them, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. The whole house of Israel. And the whole house of Israel is saying, our bones are dried up, our hope is gone, we are cut off. That's pretty hopeless. Then he goes on to say, therefore I prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, O oh, my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. Now listen, we know that God brings the exiles back to Jerusalem after 70 years of captivity, and that the city of Jerusalem is eventually Restored. The book of Ezra, the book of uh, Nehemiah, tell about that incredible story of restoration. And that story of restoration is certainly a partial fulfillment of the prophetic vision of the bones here in chapter 37. But after 70 years, after 70 years of captivity, many, if not most, of those Jewish exiles would have aged and died in Babylon. And in fact, we know that Ezekiel died there at the age of 52, so long before the exiles came back, and that his tomb is still located, located in ancient Babylon, what is now modern Iraq, in a city called Kephil. In addition, notice that this passage says the bones are the whole house of Israel. Israel had become bitterly divided into the northern and southern kingdom. And prior to the Babylonians carrying off the southern tribes into exile, the Assyrians had come previously and carried off the northern tribes into exile. 
most of the northern tribes made it back, or most of the northern tribes never made it back to Israel, as well as most of the southern tribes. So what does God mean when he says he will open up their graves and bring the whole house of Israel back home? Well, on May 14th, 1948, the nation of Israel was reborn once again after 2,000 years of a second exile that was predicted by most of these same prophets. And the prophet Isaiah may have spoken of this miraculous day when he said in Isaiah 66, 8, who has ever heard of such a thing? Who has ever seen such a thing? Can a country be born in a day or a nation brought forth in a moment? The Jewish people say, yes, it can, because it did so on May 14th, 1948. And millions of Jews representing both the northern and the southern tribes have miraculously returned to Israel since that day. Anyone know what the national anthem of Israel is called? It's called Hatikva. Hatikva is the Hebrew word, the hope. And here are the words of that song. It's just a short song. As long as the Jewish spirit is yearning deep in the heart, with eyes turned toward the east, looking toward Zion, then our hope, that 2,000-year-old hope, will not be lost, to be a free people in our land, the land of Zion and Jerusalem. That was, song was written in 1886. After 2,000 years of exile, on May 14, 1948, the Jewish people saw what was dead come back to life. And this, too, is certainly a major part of the fulfillment of God's vision to Ezekiel. But what about all the other Jews like Ezekiel and the countless others um, in both exiles who died in exile? Was God just kidding about opening up his graves? Was he not being literal when he said, I will open your graves, resurrect them to life, and bring them back home? Was this incredible vision of hope only for those who would be fortunate enough to be alive when it is finally fulfilled? Or does this vision include those who died during exile? Well, Daniel also died in Babylon. And the book of Daniel, in the book of Daniel, this is how he concludes his writings to the exiles. And I'm sure his comments are a direct response to God's prophesy, prophecy given to a good friend named Ezekiel. Daniel says this, the very last verse in the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 13, he says to the exiles, as for you, go your way till the end. You will rest, meaning you will die. And then at the end of days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. You see, exiles like Daniel and Ezekiel and the others had lost everything. But they never lost the hope that even in death, God would be faithful to resurrect their dry bones back to life. And listen to this, all you exiles in Boulder County. Never losing hope. And bringing that message of hope to the hopeless is what we're all supposed to be doing while we're living in exile. Andrew and I, along with 42 others, will be in Jerusalem in about four weeks, God willing. And while we're there, I think it would be really cool. I don't know how you feel about it, but I think it'd be really cool if all of a sudden Daniel and Ezekiel walked into town after 2,500 years of their bones being buried somewhere in ancient Babylon. Maybe tricky making the trek from Iraq to Israel. <laughs> but I believe God meant it when he said that he would one day open their graves, resurrect them back to life, and bring them back home. And I also believe that the fulfillment of this promise to them and to us is not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Remember that verse I read in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 about the life cycle? There's a time for every activity and every season under heaven. There's a time to live and a time to die. 
Solomon didn't write this stuff to be pessimistic. He wrote, it, he wrote it to be optimistic. His purpose was to give hope to a life cycle that, that often appears hopeless. But he ends this list of life cycles uh, by saying this in Ecclesiastes verse 11. He says, God makes everything beautiful in its time. You see, hope is merely a timing issue. Rabbi Saul said it this way in Romans 8, 24. Hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? The writer of Hebrews said it this way in, in, in chapter 11, verse 1. Faith is being sure of what we hope for, of certain, certain what we don't see. Hope is always in the future. You know, when you, it, you know how 1 Corinthians 13 ends? Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. You know why the greatest of these is love? The, the context of that chapter is eternity. In eternity, you won't need faith or hope. Those are all future things. The only thing that really remains when the dust settles in eternity is love. That lasts forever. Communion is what we do on the first Sunday of each month. Communion is meant to be a dissonant experience. You see, in music, those of you that know music, in a music scale, the seventh note creates a dissonant sound. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti. And th that note creates tension, doesn't it? T, it wants to go somewhere. T, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, T, do. Oh, it needs to resolve. And that's the kind of experience that communion is intended to create because we remember what took place 2,000 years ago on a particular Friday. And spiritually speaking, that Friday became is a kind of dissonant day that needs to resolve, doesn't it? And it doesn't resolve until Sunday. You see, on Friday, Jesus is on the cross, and he's dead, and blood is pouring down his face, but Sunday's coming, right? On Friday, Mary is laying in a hump on the ground crying because her baby boy is dead, but Sunday's coming. On Friday, Peter is denying and lying, but Sunday's coming. On Friday, the disciples are running away, going back to their old way of life, but Sunday's coming. Sunday's coming. And on Friday, you may be feeling hopeless because of what you've experienced in your life, but God says, hang on, because Sunday's coming. That's the message of Ezekiel's vision of the Valley of the Dry Bones. And that's the message we carry with us today while we are still living in exile. It's Friday. There's the tension, but Sunday's coming. Here's the tension. Here's the dissonance right here. And as you come forward today, I want you to come down thinking about the dissonance that still lives in the world today, in your own life. What needs to be resolved? Take it back to your seat. Let's take it together. Let's let it resolve. Let's resolve it as a community together because Jesus has conquered death, doesn't he? So let's stand up. When this song is over, we'll, we'll take this together. You'll be dismissed in your rows.